time. Father God, you are so good to us. Your tremendous love and blessing flows from heaven every single day. And it is manifested, epitomized in the love of Jesus Christ, which was shed for us. His life, his blood was shed on our behalf. So he was stricken so that we could have peace. We could have eternal life. We could have the new title of sons and daughters of God. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this amazing grace. And just like you commanded us, we've participated in the Lord's Supper to dwell with you, Jesus, every day. Father, we pray that we we'll fall in love with Jesus every day because he is our true Lord, our shepherd, and our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's go to Scripture. Let's go to read the Word of God. And we are marching into deeper territory, the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 2. Um, our passage of Scripture is actually the entire chapter of chapter 2. But for sake of time, um, let me just read verses 11 to 16 of chapter 2. If you would just follow along with your eyes, <clears throat> and uh, we can read it together that way. I'll read the whole thing. Chapter 2, verse 11 to 16, and this is the Word of God. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens, above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive, uh, save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she left them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. Amen. Amen. Uh, why are you smiling? <laughs> Thank you for reading the scripture back from back there as well with your wonderful app. Um, wherever the word of, word of God is, is good. <laughs> uh, I might have shared this story with you, episode with you before, but uh, the author Louis uh, Buscal, Buscalgia, Buscalgia was a, S, a USF, USC, USC professor, and he's an author. And he recalls an incident uh, when he was young, when he was at home and having dinner, about to have dinner. His dad came home very discouraged. His face was dark, and he gathered the family members and told them a very sad news, that his business had gone bankrupt and their future was unsure. If you're a child, if you're a wife, uh, how would you feel? You know, everybody was downcast and it was really sad. It was, you know, it was hopeless. The next day, mom, uh, Leo is uh, uh, remembering this, mom goes out outside and she sells some of her jewelry uh, and uh, she buys a lavish, extravagant dinner and brings it back home. The next night, you know, the, all the members are back home and the husband is scolding his wife. Are you out of your mind? This is not a time to have a feast. It's not a time to lavish and spend this money. It's not a time for that. And the other members were a little bit, you know, cold-shouldered as well. They were looking mom, at mom kind of strangely. And Leo remembers mom saying this, the time to rejoice is now, not tomorrow, not next week. Right now, we need the joy. And with that, the family enjoyed the meal, 
And Leo remembers that it was like Christmas Day, <laughs> Christmas dinner. They had a wonderful, beautiful dinner. After the dinner, uh, Leo's sister said, maybe I can work a little bit overtime uh, at my job, at my part-time job. And, and Leo, although he was young, he said, maybe I could um, sell more magazines uh, you know, uh, to our neighbors. And you know, after that, the mood kind of changed. And the mood was more like, we can get through this. We can you know, go through this. We can survive this kind of mode. And Leo remembers how his mom made a big difference in the morale and how she was an encourager for the family. Do you have people like that who are like always sunshine, you know, you know things can look gloomy, you have bad news, but they're always like, you know, the cup is still half full. <laughs> you would say it's half empty, but this is half full. They're so bright. And when you send group text messages, they're the ones to send those smiley emoticons and, you know, so joyful and jolly and energetic. Thank God for those people. <laughs> Amen. You know, uh, lift us up and encouraging one another, encouraging the community, in fact. Whoever is part of that is infected <laughs> by that happy virus, so to speak. It makes a difference. In fact, God has put people of God, people together to encourage one another, to strengthen one another. As people of faith, you have power to encourage somebody, and our community is supposed to um, go through thick and thin together, but we can always come out strong and see God-sized things happen when we are encouraged by the people of God. And today's message I titled, The Faith of One. A faith of one person can make a big difference. And uh, I pray that God would use every one of our faith to make a difference for significant people in your life this year. Today's uh, main character is a woman, a foreign woman, Rahab. And from her faith, we learn what the faith of one that saves us is. What is that faith of a personal faith that can save others? I want to look at that kind of faith. And uh, you know the story pretty well, I hope, but I will retell it again uh, with a better perspective since I've been to Israel last year, right? You know, Joshua, he was ready to march into the promised land of Canaan. Last week we saw that the people, especially the two and a half tribes of Israel, they emboldened Joshua saying, God be with you. Be strong and courageous. Let's do this together because God has told us to do this. In reverence of God's word, I will entrust my service to you, Joshua. The two and a half tribes said that and they were encouraged. They were emboldened. They were ready to take on the promise of God. And now Joshua was really ready to go. And he makes specific uh, plans to go into the land that God had given him. So remember, they were in the east side of the River Jordan. And they were overlooking. He you show us the map, please? Uh, into the Promised Land. And thank you. So they were here approximately. This is Google Maps, by the way. This is modern day Israel. So the names are not, it's reflective of today. <laughs> but uh, the ancient cities are still the same. They're here, they're trying to go into this promised land, cross Jordan River, this is the Dead Sea. It's Jerusalem is here, there are mountainous regions here, and there's the plain. Next picture, please, the next map. It's a zoom in of the same thing. And Joshua is ready to send in spies into Jericho to take the city. It, the ancient city is somewhere here we don't know exactly but this is the modern the, just the big uh, broader area of Jericho and uh, just like Moses' days he sent spies but instead of spend, send, uh, spend, uh, sending 12 spies he sent two for a very specific purpose to scout out the city of Jericho because it was at the entrance of the land unless you take this city you cannot go into the land of Canaan so this was a very important strategic city and the two men, oh, before we go there, can you show us the next, oh, this is green here. Can you show the next slide? I want you to give, have a picture in your mind of the modern day, the terrain and stuff. So this is a mountain uh, background of Jericho, and Jericho is you know, somewhere between these uh, trees. And, and uh, there are a lot of palm trees. Remember the, the date, palm dates <laughs> that I brought last time? And actually, I bought it from Jericho, the, that city. 
So you, had, you already had Jericho palm dates. <laughs> anyway, it's called the City of Palms in the Bible. Jericho was famous for that. It was a big city. In fact, Jericho is the oldest city in the world, uh, thousands and thousands of years old. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and so the two spies went into the city of Jericho at night. Well, close to dawn, or close to dusk, in fact. Because uh, that, that's when the time when the gates were op still open, but uh, they could still kind of hide under the shadows of the dark. And these two probably had like hoodies and you know, masks, like black masks that you have on, to be not noticed by the people. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> don't take it so seriously. Try to modernize it for us a little bit. And, and they, they went in, and uh, it, was the dark, it was getting dark, and it was night, so they had to find shelter, right? As two people who are strangers, who will be noticed by insiders. This is like a thousand people, population city. So people kind of know each other. It's, not, it's big, but it's not that big. So they know each other, and these strangers uh, would be caught. So they went to a place that people would have less suspicion of. They went to the brothel. They went to a prostitute's home. Two gentlemen going into prostitute's home might look natural, I guess. And they went into the house of Rahab. And the Bible says that her house was a part of the city wall. Uh, it, it faced the part of the city wall, city gate. So it faced the outside and they planned to stay there. But their plan was thwarted because they were noticed by people. And soon enough, the local... As soon as they went into uh, Rahab's house, the local police, you know, Jer uh, you know, the Jericho PD, came and they raided the place. And is this the end of the story? Are the spies all caught and executed? When they went, went there, they couldn't find the spies because Rahab already had already hidden them on her roof. Can you show us the roof? On the roof, there were thatched, you know, uh, these straws and she hid these two men and she went downstairs to talk to the officers if you were the off the the two spies how would you think how, how would you how, what, what emotions would go through you you'd be scared right is this woman why is she hiding us is she hiding us so that she could lead us so we could be captured to the officials and get a prize so they must have shivered they must have trembled and they're putting their ears to the ceiling, to the ground, to, to hear whatever's going, the conversation that was going on in the room, but was all mumble jumble. They couldn't understand what was going on. And then they hear the door close, the, the people leave, and she comes up with a bright face, and a, a conversation starts. And they realize why she had hidden these two spies. In verse 10, she says, We know that God has given this city to you. Israelites. And she explains where her knowledge comes from. In fact, it's, it's not just me. Everybody knows. You know, I know that everybody knows because I, I work here in this industry. I deal with men. I hear stories. I hear news. Everybody knows of the story how God had led you from Egypt. How God had destroyed the armies of the Egyptians, the superpower nation at that time, the military might. God dried the ocean for you to walk through the Red Sea. And they also heard of the Amorites, how you have defeated the two kings of Amorai and you were victorious. Those two military might, might uh, the uh, superpower, we know of them because they're neighbors and you destroyed them. And they, she says, uh, this is a hand of God. In fact, as people, we all know this, we all hear this, and our hearts are like butter in a microwave. It's all melted away. It's like nothing. There's no form. We're shivering. We're, we're so scared. And she comes to a conclusion about, she put these facts together and she comes to a conclusion of her opinion <coughs> of who they are. In verse, um, we read, Already going back to verse 11, she says, And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in a man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. My personal conclusion of you guys and your God is that He must be the God of the heaven, God of the earth. He can conquer. He is king over 
everything, every, any superpower that we know of, and you, God, is the ultimate God. She was confessing her faith in the God of Israel. Amazing. And that's why she had hid, hidden the two spies. And she looks at them directly and says, Would you spare us? Would you spare me and my family when your people come to conquer this land? Would you have mercy upon us? And so the two spies agree, right? And they promise with their lives that we will protect whoever's in this unit. Whoever you and whoever's in it, your mom and dad, your, your uh, brothers and sisters and their relatives, whoever is in this unit, we will save, we promise by our lives. And then she, Rahab, does the unthinkable, something very brave. She uh, lowers this scarlet rope down from her window, right? Can you show us the picture? We missed a couple of pictures, I think. Yeah, there. So they're on the roof having the conversation, and Rahab uh, lowers this red scarlet uh, rope down from the city uh, gate. Uh, this is the wall, uh, the apartment, not apartment, her, her house unit. And... Uh, she lays, lets them go. This was an act of treason. This was illegal. She was betraying her people. This was a dangerous act uh, of, of uh, you know, going against her own people. And as she lay, lets them go, she gives them information, very important information. The police that I've misled uh, away, they might be on your tracks. So can you show us a map again of the zoomed in Jericho? Instead of going back to your people, go to the mountains. Speaking of mountains, right? So if you see the, can you show the bigger map, the one before? You know, uh, so all this is mountainous, and that's why the Bible says going up to Jerusalem. It was literally, you know, terrain-wise, it was a going uphill thing. So they hid in the mountains for three days. So the people were pursuing them had kind of lost their track and they can come back to their people. Let's go back. Uh, and so Rahab gave these people all this news. And when we didn't read this scripture, the last verse of chapter two, when the spies came back to Joshua, they said, and they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands and also all the inhabitants of the land of the land melt away because of us. Who said this before? Rahab did. They were just repeating the words of Rahab. Rahab had influenced these two people of God. We are surprised that a foreign woman, a Gentile woman, Rahab is the main character of this beautiful story. And uh, this story does not end just in Joshua, but we find her name again in the book, in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. We find that she is heralded, you know, as a, a, uh, you know, a, a warrior of faith who has been an example for all of, of us. So the question for us to recap this story is, what is the faith that saves us? What is the one person's faith? What what kind of faith is it that saves a community of believers? The first is this, and I, I, I invite you to write in your bulletins. Uh, it is a confession faith. It is a confession faith. Can you say it together? It is a confession faith. The faith that saves others is a faith that confesses. Confession kind of faith. Rahab was an ordinary person, right? She was a you know, a gal living in the city, uh, actually industry that you don't want to be in, but she was just an average person. She was no leader of the city. She was no military strategist, but she had information. She knew everybody, it was common knowledge. Like, like we know, everybody knows that Ukraine and Russia are at war. Everybody knew that these Israelites were fighting the battle and coming up to this place right now. Everybody knew that, but it was only Rahab who confessed her faith, putting all these facts together. It must be the true God. Your God must be the God of heaven and earth. And she voiced it out. She made it clear to the people she was hiding. And she was making a, a checking side, in fact. I choose your God because your God is the true God of heaven and earth. 
She wasn't betraying her people. She was choosing life. To confess your faith is powerful. Do you know the power of the confession of your faith? Confessing something is confessing, uh, confessing your faith is a confession in the future. I think I liken the uh, confession of faith to like a marriage vow, marriage covenant. You've seen marriage covenants, right? And you actually probably some of you have been in one uh, covenant. And they usually say, you know, I, I love you forever. Of course you do. You're getting married. <laughs> and uh, actually, that is not a wedding vow. You know, people just say, I love you forever. But that is not a wedding vow. That is not a wedding covenant. A marriage covenant is looking at the future until death do us part. Thick and thin, riches or poor, I will continue to love you. So help me God. That is a promise for the future. It is a, a covenant. I think, I believe the confession of faith is, is just that. It's a confession. It is a entrusting your life to God. Although you don't know what the future may uh, entail, you are confessing your faith at the time for the future right now. Um, it was Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller, who uh, uses this illustration and uh, it really touched my heart. Uh, it made sense to me as he was talking in his book, Meaning of Marriage. He talks about the, the wedding vow, the marriage vow, and he says, he uses the illustration of uh, the siren, the mythical creature siren. Remember her in the Greek mythology, Ulysses? Uh, you know, you've probably seen the siren on Starbucks cups, <laughs> the lady with a tail and trying to entice people with uh, coffee scent. Uh, I'm very enticed. <laughs> but uh, in the myth, she is a, a mermaid in the Mediterranean Ocean, and she has a beautiful voice. Whoever hears that voice is enticed, and they are enamored by it. They are pulled by it to the extent of jumping into the water, to, and, and they kill themselves. Anyway, Ulysses wanted to hear the beautiful si uh, sound of the siren. Uh, and so as he was sailing the ocean, he tells his men, his sailors, when we cross this part of the ocean, you need to put wax into your ears so you will not hear the sound. But would you please tie me to the mast of this ship? Whatever I say, whatever crazy thing I might demand of you, just be on course. Don't change. Just tie me up and, you know, strangle me and just keep me there. Tie to the mast. And the story goes that Ulysses, you know, goes through that and he becomes crazy. He wants to break out. He wants to, you know, uh, join the, the siren. But they, the ship finally comes out of earshot distance and they are safe. And he is able to, you know, survive. And the siren actually commits suicide because <laughs> they have failed. You know, marriage covenant is like that. You know, it, it's a binding thing. Although, 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 although we don't know what I will do, what crazy things I will be enticed by, the attractions and sins and stuff like that, a confession of your vow, your marriage, is that I will love you to the best of my ability till death do us part. A confession of faith is like that, being married to God. God, I don't know what this year holds, but you are my God. You are my shepherd, and I am your sheep, and I intend to be under your care. As you confess that, as you voice that, it becomes a powerful rope that sustains us through the difficult times of faith. The faith that saves us is a confession faith. And I remember over the past 10 years, I, uh, we baptized many people you know, from our church. And before we baptize people, we hear the confession of faith. And Ada did that last year, right? Uh, praise the Lord. And one of those people I uh, baptized, I remember very vividly until this day, it was very memorable. There was a young adult who was a, a beautiful young adult, you know, young man, uh, you know, and uh, they were in college here, lived you know, two or three years, went to come to church. And one day, uh, before he was graduating, he came to me and asked, Pastor Joseph, can I be baptized? And I asked, why do you want to be baptized? And he told me a story, you know, to give you a secret, tell you a secret. I could tell you this because it's many, many years have passed. Uh, I'll tell you a secret. You know, I have this tendency to like men. I have a homosexual tendency in my life. 
as I've been reading the Bible, as I've been hearing the messages and been in the beautiful community of faith, brothers and sisters who accept me, I don't think this pleases God, and I want to change. But do you think I can still be baptized? If you were Pastor Joseph, what would you say? How dare you? <laughs> I said, of course. Confession of faith, being baptized is your willingness to say, I want to bind myself to your will. I want to give up myself to your will, whatever seems pleasing to you. Although I'm not there, none of us are there, you know, to the standards of God. But a confession is, of faith is like Rahab. I believe that your God is the true God, so I bind myself to your God. We're not there, but we can bind ourselves to Jesus Christ, our true Lord and Shepherd. And he made a confession of faith before he was baptized. And people in you know, the community close to him knew what he was talking about because he couldn't talk very vaguely. But uh, we under I understood. And he was baptized that Sunday. It's a beautiful story of how a confession was so powerful and not only changed, encouraged him, but encouraged all of us in the process. Brothers and sisters, if you claim to have faith, if you want to have faith that saves people, voice your faith. Amen. I pray that you will be able to voice your faith. I'm talking about public confession of your faith. Um, if you have not been baptized as an adult, as a person who, have, who has received Jesus Christ, I encourage you to voice your faith in public confession through baptism or sharing your faith with others. And it doesn't have to be something dramatic as a, a baptism ceremony. You can also be confessing your faith in your small group. Just saying, you know, I read the scripture this morning, I don't know if I could live, live, live up to it, but I pray that this will be my life, that God would use me as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That confession of faith, others hear it and pray for you and encourage one another to save one another. And Rahab was able to save her community, her people, her family members because of her confession of faith. So brothers and sisters, let's voice our faith, amen? Let's not be afraid, but let's voice our faith. And we also find a second principle from Rahab, the woman of faith. What made her faith so special? She not only voiced her faith, but it was, it was a faith that was put to action. It is an action faith. So you can put, write the word action. A faith that saves others is an action faith. Not only a confession faith, but an action faith. Rahab didn't just after the confession, leave them and, and just get out of here, whatever. You know, she didn't do that. She did something bold, something very dangerous. She let out a, a rope, a line for them to, to escape. It was going against the law of Jericho, and it was an act of treason. She could have lost her life, but it was an act, active act of obedience to the Lord because of her faith. And in fact, Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 31 says this about Rahab. It says, By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. What does the Bible call faith of Rahab? She had given a friendly welcome and a friendly exit implied there. She acted in faith. The other people also knew about, they knew all the facts, they heard everything, the trends and, and the news and how the God was doing these amazing things uh, in their neighborhood. But it was only Rahab who obeyed and acted in faith and put, that, put down that line. And as the spies exited out, they promised Rahab, saying that whenever, you know, as you, you, you gave this, this rope for us to, to leave, when we come back, Lay down this rope. Have this rope hanging so that we'll know that this is your house. Maybe the spies remembered something. They remembered when Moses was exiting out of Egypt. When the people of out Egypt were exiting out of Egypt, God had asked them, told them, command them, in fact, to paint the doorpost of every Israelite home with the blood of a lamb. The red 
blood of the lamb and who, whenever, wh whichever house was covered with that blood, God will pass over and not put judgment and kill the firstborn of the, of the household. And it was a sign of salvation. Maybe that's why the spy said, this red rope signifies your, li your life. So whenever we see this red rope, we'll not destroy this particular household. And Rahab remembered that. And she obeyed and she uh, gathered all her members, house members, to be saved uh, when the time came. We'll see that next time. And I was uh, really uh, amazed this week to see Rahab's name again as I was doing the quiet time. This person of faith who acted in faith. In Matthew chapter 1, can you show us a part of my Bible that I tore out for you guys so you could see it? I'm just kidding, it's just copy and paste, right? <laughs> it says the genealogy of Jesus Christ and Abraham, father of Isaac, father of Jacob, and you know, Judah, and so forth. And I read on and it says... There was a guy called Salmon, and he married Rahab. Rahab gave birth to Boaz. Boaz gives to Jesse, uh, and Jesse gives birth to, guess who? David, king. And this goes on to the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Could it be that Rahab's faith, acting faith, fact, uh, uh, faith in actions, just not stop, stop with her salvation, but it it had a ripple effect, saving uh, the generations to come, even giving birth to King David and to Jesus Christ. And us who believe in Jesus Christ as Son of God, she becomes our ancestor of faith. That ripple, that wave is coming to us as well. One person's faith has saved, in fact, the whole world through Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't you want that kind of faith? The Bible is shouting at us, the faith that saves others is the faith that, it, that you act upon. It's an action kind of faith. As I close, I want to share one story. I was listening to a testimony this week of a lady who is a musician in Korea, and she is a, a person who defected from North Korea. Uh, she escaped dangerous situation, you know, horrible situations. But in fact, in North Korea, she was doing pretty well. She was an elite family, and she was a pianist. She graduated. She even did her PhD uh, at the Arts National Arts Institute there in Pyongyang. Uh, and uh, she recalls it, this was in an interview in South Korea, and the interviewer asked, "So, how did you become a Christian?" And she says, "When I was young, a little girl." I was, uh, my mom made me practice the piano, but something, there was something about her that she asked me to some, do something very strange. Every time I, uh, she asked me to practice some, a piece, she said, oh, before you do this piece, play one piece from this black book. Every day, without fail, play something from this black book, this leather black book. And it was a hymnal, <laughs> in fact, in North Korea, which is very dangerous. She later defects, you know, as an adult, um, and she realized that that hymnal was the Word of God. The Word of God was made into songs in the hymnal, and she came to believe in Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. She later marries another musician, another defect, defector from North Korea, and together they uh, are going around the world doing testimonies, and, and he's a violinist, she's a pianist, perfect combination, doing concerts. For the Lord, giving glory to God and sharing their faith to people like us. And just a small announcement, we've invited them in March. So you don't want to miss that Sunday. I'm not going to tell you which Sunday, <laughs> but I will let you know. Uh, you know, a, a mom's act of faith, it's not big. Just play this piece before you practice. This is very important. Although she, might, she didn't understand at the time, it was illegal, in fact, to do that. A small act of faith someday changed her faith, her life. And it changes so many lives today because of the mom's faith. So brothers and sisters, it is our encouragement and challenge to all of us that if we want to have faith, one person's faith that saves us, saves a community, let us not be afraid to voice our faith. Amen? Let us not be afraid to act on our faith. 
when our faith is in action, when our faith is voiced out, God starts to work. He does amazing things, as we'll see uh, in Jericho. And He will encourage not only our faith, but save your family and our community. And this is my faith. Amen. Let's pray. The Holy Spirit has spoken to us through His Word, showing us this beautiful woman of faith. And as an example, as a showcase, saying that you can be that one person of faith that powerfully influences places where there is little love, there's no life, and there is no God. Let's pray this time, God, would you use my life and my faith to be such a valuable, precious voice, a valuable action to others so that they can have life through Jesus Christ. May my words, my actions, not only be pleasing to you, Lord, but let it be life-saving for somebody who is desperate for you. Let's go to our Lord in prayer and ask that. Father God, we thank you that you have shown us this amazing power of faith of this beautiful woman who was a nobody, but because she became world famous, because they, she voiced out her faith in you, because she acted out her faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that we will be able to do the same every day. Give us the courage and opportunity to say that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Father, help us to love a brother and sister in your name so that many will come to know Jesus as Jesus Lord and Savior. Whoever is in our family, Just the word mourn for, well, for me, only one purpose. When do we use it? Anybody? Yes. Yes, perfectly. Thank you, Leah. When somebody dies, we say what? Oh, they're in mourning. Right? When people die, I think that's about the only time we use that word mourn. Oh, he's in mourning because his mom died. He, his mom passed away. Oh, she's in mourning because her grandparents, grandma, grandpa just passed away. We associate that word mourn when we lose somebody who's very, very dear to us. And this is what the Bible is talking about. That we need to mourn. That when we mourn, that we will be blessed. Now, how many of you here have mourned before? For me, I have, and I'm pretty old, and I can honestly tell you I've mourned two times in my life. I have mourned two times in my life. The first, when I truly f repented. You know, I was a sophomore. How many of you are sophomores here? One, right there. <laughs> when I was sophomore, you know, i that's the first time I really felt that God died for me. Before that, I knew it in my head. Oh, God died for me. He was on the cross. Oh, it was so, so much pain, suffering. But that one day, it really hit my heart. And you know what made me mourn even more than the fact that he actually died was the fact that, you know, he died for me. And he's been waiting for me. But the fact that I've been indifferent for him for all of these times, that I knew about him, but I simply didn't care. And when I, when that came up, I really mourned. I mourned for the death of Jesus Christ. I mourned for his love for me. And I mourned because... He was in such a great pain waiting for me to return to him. And I could actually feel God's 
heartache in my heart. Oh, God's waiting for me even now with his open arms. He's saying, come to me. And I've just been like, okay. When I really felt that, it really made me mourn. The second time was when my mom passed away. The pain of her passing was so great that I wept and mourned for about over a month. You know, I don't know if you remember, but basically me and my mom was it. I don't have any siblings. I'm the only child. And it was just me and my mom. And I knew ever since when I was a kid, all the double jobs, the triple shifts that she did was all for me. And, and you know, I wanted to do well. I mean, I didn't do my best at school, but I mean, I did whatever I could. And I did all these things to make her happy, actually. So I went into college. I tried to get a good job. I, you know, tried to, you know, so I could provide for her and all that. But when she passed away, I had this feeling, why do I even need to study anymore? I mean, I was going to study so I could make it for my mom, you know, provide for her. But she's dead. I don't need to study anymore. I don't know if I should be saying this, but I mean, it's the reality. So, and I was 21 years old. I was a, a junior in college when, when, when she passed away. So, I sat home for about a month and a half, and only thing I did was just drink. I mean, I don't want to say, but it's the reality. I bought a box of Jack Daniel. I went home, and then I just drank. I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. I didn't study. I didn't go to class. I got all Fs that semester. I mean, I've never ever done that before. Straight Fs. <laughs> because I didn't, I was in such mourning, I didn't feel the need to go on living anymore. I was like, why do I have to do all these things? It doesn't really mean anything. Who cares about this? You know, if I get a good grade, who's going to be happy? You know, my mom's like, it's like, hey, I got such a good grade. <laughs> I got such a great job. No, there's nobody there. And I was so, so in mourning that nothing in this world mattered. And then after about a month and a half, I was praying, and the thing that revived me was a person, person of Jesus Christ. When I was in, when I was praying, Jesus Christ reminded me that she was in a good place, that she was with him, and she was happier now, believe it or not, than she was with me. You know, I couldn't believe that at the beginning, but now I believe that because I felt it in my prayer. Jesus Christ touched my heart. You know, Jesus Christ comforted me, and I revived. I went back next semester, took all the classes again, and I did well. You know, today's scripture tells us that mourning is a blessing because they will be comforted. When you mourn, usually when you're really sad, your parents really can't be that much of a help sometimes. You know what I mean? You're really sad. And you, you may talk to them, but, you know, they really can't feel what you're feeling at that moment. And most of what they, they say may not really help you, may not comfort you because it's yours. Your pain is nobody else's. It's just yours. It has your signature all over it. Nobody in this world felt exactly the way you feel. The only one who could really comfort you is God who created you, who made you, and who knows exactly what you're going through. God went through all of the pain and suffering so he could, what, sympathize with us. And what God is saying is, when you mourn, you are blessed because what? That's when you are coming to me and I could now com comfort you and com comfort you perfectly. You come to me, and I can comfort you like nobody else in this world. You know, we try to be comforted by things of the world. Better car, I don't know, better job, better house, better clothes. I don't know what better can, you, you can get, but if you 
kind of listen to me. There's really not much money could buy you. But we are obsessing over these things. Better car, better. So what? I'd rather be in a small, dungy little place with my family than a 4,000, 40,000 feet mansion, castle by myself. I'd be so lonely there. It'd be like a big prison. You know, I pray that you guys will truly seek comfort, not from the things of the world, but from the only person who could truly comfort you, which is God. And the third blessedness is the result of the first two. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What's the title of the message today? Somebody speak it out. Let's say two. One, two, three. Okay. How many of you want earthly blessings? One, two, three, four, five. People want earthly blessings too. People that are usually not happy with only just heavenly blessings. They say, God, heavenly blessing is great. But can I just get a little bit of that here now while I'm here? I want some heavenly plus earthly and one plus one kind of a deal. Okay, God? Well, I'll tell you the secret today. Because blessed are the meek for they shall what? Inherit the earth. You're going to get not only heavenly blessing, but earthly blessing. As we discussed, when we are poor in spirit, when we are mourning because of the re, uh, realization of our sinfulness and God's love and sacrifice, we cannot help but to become meek. We discussed this already. When you say, okay, I'm such a sinner, there's this, such a great God, and I'm mourning because of my sinfulness, but I'm comforted by God. I become meek, not because I try to be meek, but because I cannot help but to be meek. We discussed this already. That because I know I'm such a sinner, it makes me meek. Because I am absence of pride. My pride, in this world, the biggest thing that gets you every single time is your pride. When you are absent of your pride, Basically, when you are not full of yourself, and now you are able to be filled with God, that's when you shall inherit the earth. But how is that blessing to inherit the earth? Well, the problem of getting the blessings of the earth from the worldly things that we're just not. We're just not happy. You know, a lot of college kids, uh, high school kids, think you'll be so much happy if you go to great college, right? How many of you will be really, really happy if you go to Stanford? Nobody wants to go to Stanford here? <laughs> Nobody? It's not a good school? <laughs> okay. For those who went to Stanford, are you so much happier now because you went to Stanford? <laughs> those who think that a great job will make you happy how about a job teaching at Stanford <laughs> how many think that would be great yeah a lot of people is that giving you such earthly blessings now no <laughs> people who think if I just get married to that person <laughs> that'd be so happy well, I don't want to ask because she's probably going to say he is very, very happy. So The problem is, you know that story about the caterpillar that just goes up and up and up that tree and at the end finds nothing? That's the world, right? We just feel that if we just get to that next place, that we'll be happy. If, and then when you get to there, it's like, okay, I need to just get to that next place and I'll be happy. And you'll be just going to the next place and next place until you cannot get to the next place anymore because reality is in this world, this world is not that easy. You, you're going to get to a place where you cannot go to the next place. There's going to be caterpillars that's going to be not running over you, but what? what it, sliding over you, 
gliding over you. You know, Ecclesiastes 1.8 says this, all things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. 5.10 says this, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with all its income. We are just built where we just aren't satisfied. We could really not ne never reach that place. We are always looking, looking, looking. The meek inherits the earth because meek, those who are meek are already satisfied. Those who are meek are already satisfied because they're always content with what they have because they have who? They have God. It doesn't matter where they are socially on this earth. They already have the best thing. And no matter what their current situation in this world, they're already happy. They've inherited everything that they need to. Everything is bonus. Everything is extra. Job was completely satisfied when he met God. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 6 says this, as having nothing yet possessing all things. I don't have a house. I don't have a wife. I don't have a kid. But I have everything. Because I have God. Philippians 4, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Meek are people who are already fulfilled, satisfied. You know, many of us, even Christians, aren't really satisfied with our life. We just want more and more and more. The problem is because they are not meek, because of their pride. I have pride. When I see my friends, I don't know about high school because it's been so long, but I know people who graduated from college, you know, they see their friends. And man, I was smart as that kid. You know, he was like nothing, but wow, he's make you know, he's making more money. He has even beautiful wife than me. And, you know, he has all these things. And I said, oh man, I need more. I need more to be happy. This world, it's very, very hard to have earthly blessings because you never have enough. I'll tell you why meekness is such a blessing. Think of all the times, all the effort that you wasted in being concerned about yourself. Think of all those times when I was, oh, man, I need this, I need that, you know. A person who is meek isn't concerned about themselves and they are not defensive about themselves. Why did that person say that to me? Are they just, you see, disrespecting me? Why she said that? You know, most of us are very defensive all the time because what? We have pride. 자존심. You know, how dare they say that? The meek person is a, is a person who is not concerned about themselves because they're concerned about God and others. Their focus is not about me, 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 me. Their focus is about how to love God and people around me. Their defensive level is way low. Their eyes are on God and not on themselves to feel defensive or even feel sorry for themselves. Why is these things happening to me? Woe was to me. And what, it, what happens when that happens? You're going to be filled with sadness. You're going to be in depression. The meek will inherit the earth because the meek are comforted by God. Amen. There's nothing in this world there's no one, there's nothing who could really comfort you. Not even your parents to that level. 
you will really truly find no comfort. Only in God. So when you become meek in your sinfulness, when you empty yourself of your pride, when you are no longer concerned about self, no longer defensive, you'll find when you have God that that is all you need. And when you come to that position, when God could bless you without you being full of pride again and say, I'm better than you guys, then guess what? I truly believe God will bless you because God blesses many, many people in the Bible because they were ready to be blessed. Because they were ready for the blessing without becoming evil, without becoming proud. God's not going to give you something that's going to make you a sinner. If if you want straight A's, you want to go to Harvard, you get a great job, so you could be full of yourself. Is God going to give you that? No, because it's going to make you be even further from him. The meat shall inherit the earth. And as I close, I want to point out to you that Christian is someone who is entirely different from everyone else. Okay. Even though you're not ready to be poor in spirit, even though you're not ready to, to mourn because of your sinfulness, even though you're not ready to become so humble and meek, you need to understand this one thing. Christian is somebody who's totally different from anybody else. You as a Christian need to be totally different from all your friends in school. We have a different standard. We have a different priorities. We have different sense of blessedness. It's not blessing to be rich. Because it will take you away from God. It's blessed to be poor in spirit. It's not a blessing to be proud. But it's blessed to be meek. To be humble. We are blessed. Not through our efforts. Not through our position. Because through God's grace. It is impossible for those who do not have God. To consider these things as blessings. You talk to your friends who are not Christian and you say, hey, it's a really good thing to be poor in spirit. It's a really good thing to mourn and be really, you know, cry your eyes out. It doesn't make sense. To, how is that? You guys are crazy. Our standard is totally from the worldly standard. That's why Christian is first and foremost, not what you do, but who you are. And let me tell you, you cannot fake Christianity and be happy. I want you to really understand that. You cannot fake Christianity. You could fake it, yes. But you can't fake it and be happy at the same time. Because Christianity will give you all these blessings that are so different. If you fake it outside and it's not in your heart, you will never be happy because you will never be happy with those things that God, God wants to give you blessing through poor and spirit. And, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? I need to succeed. I need to do better. A person who is not a Christian cannot be happy pursuing these blessings from God. I really pray that all of you are or will become true Christians. Those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, and those who are meek. Because you will have the kingdom of God, because you will be comforted by God, and you will have earthly blessings. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. You have the answers to everything. You have the, the blessings of the blessings. You have the greatest blessings. 